All right, I'm going to succumb to a little bit of peer pressure here and make a video response to Mir Christian Logos, William Tyndale, and a little bit to Matthew 419. William Tyndale's been gnawing on me, uh, chastising me. Apparently, I haven't been responsive enough in uh, commenting or making video responses. So uh, here's my attempt at being a little more responsive. He's also decided that he can attribute some intent to me uh, based on that silence. Let me set the record straight, and I'll begin by responding to a video by Mir Christian Logos, which I appreciate very much, uh, where he answers my questions about election, at least somewhat. He doesn't really answer them in the Reformed tradition, which is what I was specifically asking for, but I don't care about that. I, a video response is a video response. I think they're, as long as they're not abusive, I think they're all welcome. They're all to be cherished and welcomed because it takes a lot for somebody to make a video. I will link it below, of course. I want to begin by something he ended with, and that was he asked if I believed it was evil to serve the Lord, then he sort of said, well, then you can go and serve uh, whatever you're going to serve. I don't believe it's evil to serve the Lord, uh, just obviously, because um, I don't believe there is a Lord. I think people are serving something, I guess, in, in a sense, when they, when they do believe. I don't really myself believe I'm serving anything. Um, I live my life, I try to be uh, receptive to concepts and ideas, and I try to make the best, uh, sort them out the best way that I can, and just move forward. Uh, I hear a lot of talk about uh, everybody worships, and I'm, not, I'm just not sure that I do, and I'm, and I'm not sure what that, what that even means. I think there are plenty of people who don't worship anything. I think you'd have to be careful about the definition of serving and worshiping. He also said in the video, he talks a lot about redemption, and he says, whosoever believeth in him shall be saved. Are you, Mike, are you going to be a whosoever? And again, getting back to the Reformed theology, I guess the question that I originally posed to Calvinists it, it has more to do with how do we get to the stage of belief? And do I have any authority over that, at least in this particular area? And, I, and this is why I made a recent video on the shifting goalposts of agency, because I hear everybody imploring me to believe. I know that I can't choose my beliefs. And I'm also told that I'm suppressing the truth in my unrighteousness. So there's agency there on my part, is the, the message I'm getting. But then the Calvinists will say that uh, nothing is outside the sovereign will and decree of God, and he has to replace your heart of stone with a heart of flesh. And so I've revised my question to Calvinists thusly. Under whose authority do I even desire to seek God? Under whose authority do I actually believe? How is that belief formed? Because the whosoever shall believe, is a foregone, shall believe is a foregone conclusion if you account for how the belief comes about in the first place. Then whoever, whosoever believes shall be saved. So it's really more a question. It's not so much a question for me of, uh, you know, if you believe, will you be saved? How do we get to the belief and under whose authority? Um, let's see, what else did he say here? One thing that Mere Christian Logos said, and it actually got me thinking, is he, he, he asked me if I was going to remain hardened. And he talked about Pharaoh's heart. And if I'm not mistaken, it was God that hardened Pharaoh's heart. So this, again, gets back to the question for me of agency when it comes to belief. On your theology, obviously I don't believe any of this, but on your theology, who hardens hearts? And who ultimately has the authority over belief in God? I understand maybe I've got some creaturely will, as Matthew 419 would say, to choose a red car or a blue car, choose my wife, choose the music that I like subjectively. But what about actual belief? And why does this agency seem to move around between you are suppressing the truth and we're appealing to you to seek God, and then a Calvinist will turn around and say, 
only God, it's only through the grace of God that you can be saved. So for instance, in the podcast, the Bible Thumping Wingnut podcast, where they dissected my question for Calvinists, Colin Pearson had said, actually, if you were to come to me and say that you did all these things that it, that it required to be saved, you buried your nose in the carpet and begged forgiveness and, and admitted that Jesus Christ died for your sins and you have sinned against God and God alone and all that stuff, and nothing happened, that he wouldn't believe it. Because the only way someone would actually humble themselves to that degree would, would be through the grace of God. So again, at that point, the belief and being saved is a foregone conclusion. I'm more interested in how do we get there, if that helps. Something that Mir Christian Logos said in his video as well that really um, hit me like a ton of bricks. I'd never heard this term before. Maybe it's a common term. I don't know. He said, are you going to remain hardened? Are you going to remain uncircumcised in your heart? I'd never heard this before. And I will admit, my knee-jerk response was uh, disgust at the concept, the very, the very notion of this. Obviously, I feel like any kind of genital mutilation in reality, in practice, is disgusting. Uh, I, you know, it, it, it is a theft, right? It, clearly, unless you are 35 years old and you were uncircumcised, or you had intact female genitalia, and then you decided of your own volition through no dysfunction uh, up here to do that, well, okay. I don't, you know... I mean, there's a piercing, and then there's that, and who knows, you know, people do some strange things to themselves. Some people file their teeth to points. It's not for me to say anything about that, but when you do that to an infant, it's a theft. And this concept, and I understand the point you were making with that. I mean, it's, it's just another way of saying, are you going to, are you not going to submit? To remain uncircumcised in your heart is to not submit to the will of God. And I understand that. But it made me think a little bit about what I've always said in a video that, response that I made to William Tyndale, which is right now set unli un, uh, unlisted. It's in, a video, it's in one of the comments that he replied to. I did post the link, but I haven't made it public yet because I, I don't know if it's, it's probably too rambling, kind of like this one's turning out to be, to be of use to any of the general public. I may turn up public, I don't know. But I said to him in there, you have to understand my upbringing was completely irreligious. So when you tell me these things, uh, they're completely foreign to me. They, they don't resonate with me, and, and uh, so I'm going to require, I guess, probably a little bit more uh, salesmanship than maybe somebody else would. I, I was never in the faith. I've never lost my faith. I've never deconverted. This is all very, very foreign to me. It's only been in, in the last bunch of years that I've even come to understand some of these concepts. I made a video in the fall about Matthew 4.19, uh, talking about a video where he talked to some Jehovah's Witnesses, and I said in the video that he scared me, because I'd never heard the depth of the Calvinist philosophy to expressed like that before. So these concepts are all quite new to me. But the one thing that I realized is I am circumcised. So while I was raised sort of irreligious through the normal pressures, my parents were raised Roman Catholic, through the normal pressures, and I apologize if this is uh, TMI for everybody, but uh, I, I, so be it. Uh, um, my parents, I think, were succumbing to the pressures from their families, even though they had pretty much lost their faith by the time that I was born. It was sort of what you do, and so they did it. So I'm not unaffected by religiosity, actually. I, I've been physically affected by that. and uh, But, of course, by the time I was at the age where I could conceptualize anything, there were none of those doctrines being thrown around, and I wasn't uh, indoctrinated into any of these uh, concepts, for lack of a better word. This gets me um, past mere Christian logos. Um, I'm going to hop past William Tyndale a little bit here just because I did just make a video for him last night and I'm going to move to Matthew 419. So I would reiterate my question for Calvinists, uh, Len, as being under whose authority do I even desire to seek God? Under whose authority do I then believe? And how does that agency compare with um, suppressing the truth in unrighteousness? Can I force myself to not suppress the truth if not by the grace of God? That's the new question. Your comment on my video 
um, reaffirms something that I said to William Tyndale. Uh, William Tyndale said, uh, you go on as though you haven't had an answer to your question, as though you'll have some sort of an excuse before God. And I said to him in my unlisted video, you've answered a question, but it's not the one I asked, because he answered the question from his theological background, which is, uh, he answered the question, you know, who is saved and, and um, why only some? Well, because basically by his theology, some just don't choose it. And the agency in that case would be on them. And so I'm looking at this more from the Calvinist Reformed concept, why only some? Why does God choose not to enter into the soul or heart of certain people? Why are there vessels of wrath fitted for destruction? And why are there vessels of mercy? That really is, is the question. And I would affirm, I would say Matthew 4.19's comment on my video affirms that I still have yet to receive an answer to the question, and I may never, because I think in some ways it's unanswerable. I mean, how can a man know the answer to that question? Why does God choose some, before they're even born, to be fitted for destruction? And obviously to me the notion that he would be somehow glorified by eternal torment and torture is one of the main reasons, obviously, that uh, I say main. There are many reasons why I reject the theology, but that's a damn good one. And I said in my video that the answers I'd been given, the closest things I'd been given to an answer were the Cy Ten Brugenkate type of answer for a reason sufficient to God, or as my mom used to be told by her parents, uh, it's, a, it's a mystery, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Or the divine command theory answer, hey, doesn't matter what the answer is, it's God rules. God's rules, if you don't like it, well, you're going to suffer for it kind of thing. And I said those answers are not good enough. And the response I got from Matthew 419 was not an answer, but just sort of an accusation. And if there's one way to make someone with fairly conservative views who doesn't uh, partake in most of the social safety net entitlement programs and that sort of thing. If there's one way to get someone like that riled up is to tell them that they have an entitlement complex. And Matthew 419 basically did that. He said, you know, answer not good enough for you? Well, that's a typical liber um, liberal entitlement syndrome. Now I understand, Lynn. Now let's, let's take a breath for a moment. This is just YouTube, right? We're doing good. Let's stay doing good. I understand that's your theology, and I understand by your belief set, uh, who am I to even ask that question? Never mind how sufficient is the answer. I understand that. It's hard because I would like to be respectful to you and your, your belief system, but at the same time, you're attempting to sell it to me. Now, I know you're going to say, no, we're not selling it to you. We are just here to preach the message. God does the work. Well, Kind of, but it's funny, for me, it's almost as though I'm sitting here and somebody's trying to sell me a car. Forgive the analogy, but just, just go with me. Just get loosen up a little bit. Just go with me. Someone's trying to sell me a car, and I'm saying, well, I'd like my mechanic, if I wasn't one, to have a look at it and make sure that you know everything's in good condition. And uh, you're saying, no, 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 no. Listen, you have to take our word for it. This is, and it's the only car left. Like. After this, there's going to be no more cars. So if you don't buy this car, you're going to be without wheels. So never mind getting it checked out. Never mind making sure that it meets the uh, Transport Canada safety requirements. And never mind that, you know, never mind all of that. Just, just take our word for it. But you're telling me that that's what you're doing, right? Because you get all kinds of worked up if I, if I have questions or challenge things. What you should be doing and what you're telling me you're doing is that you're more like the the um, non-commissioned sales staff, right? No pressure here, no pressure, no gimmicks. We just show you the car and you make your decision and our paycheck isn't based on whether or not you actually buy the car. So listen, all we're gonna do is show you the car and if you don't buy it, well, that's not on us, right? That's not our responsibility. That's what you're telling me you're doing. But you're acting like the other. You're acting like the commissioned guy who just wants to make that sale. It's got to be today. It's got to be. And if I challenge you and I say, I think those only come with a 5.7 V8. And you're saying, no, 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 no. That's a 5.3 liter. 
And I said, well, no, I'm pretty sure. And, and then you're getting, you know, you're getting upset. You're getting really worked up over this because, uh, because this is important because maybe I, I've told you I'm only looking for a 5.3 and you've pointed me to a car and it's got a 5.7 and we're starting to, we're starting to banty around. And then I say, I want to get it checked out by my mechanic. And you're like, no, 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 no. After this one, there's no more cars. You've got to just buy this one. And you're trying to sell me the paint protection package and the extended warranty to boot. So I don't know, I'm not sure why that is. There's, there's two different things at play here. But the bottom line is, I better look at my notes. I think that was it. The bottom line for me is, I still haven't had an answer to that question. You say it's a sort of liberal entitlement syndrome. And again, I have pretty conservative views, so that's a bit of an affront to me uh, politically, philosophically. Um, but I say, from my worldview or belief set, it's a perfectly reasonable question. This would be like a, a reasonable question like me inquiring as to, uh, I don't know, are there any outstanding recalls on this vehicle you're trying to sell me? Or has it ever been in a major accident? Right? From my point of view, from my standpoint, when you're coming to me with something, and I understand that your belief set says, I know all this already, I reject that, right? Still, you're the one trying to sell me something. And it's a reasonable question from my side of the fence. I hope you can understand that. I hope you can understand that from my point of view, that's a completely reasonable question. In fact, it's probably one of the most reasonable questions considering that what I'm being told is that eternity is at stake. This is, the most important questions should at least attempt to be answered as far as I'm concerned, especially when we're talking about, well, I would say decisions to be made, but I don't think it's really a decision that can be made. I haven't read through your other comment, Len, where you said something about me sitting down and reading through all, the, all of scripture. Uh, I've attempted that actually, and I've come to the conclusion that's probably never gonna happen, not in entirety. And it's certainly not with the, all the proper hermeneutic guides and, and linguistic, um, you know, keys, uh, ciphers or whatever. It's just not going to happen. That's part of the reason I asked the question, because I kind of have to rely on the experts. I did do some research, and I do do research. I'm not saying, because I know what's going to happen now. You're going to say, you say you have these questions, but you're not asking genuinely. I do do a lot of research. I just don't have the time and, quite frankly, the inclination under whose authority do I actually have the inclination to read the entire Bible? Interesting question. To sit down and read through the Bible cover to cover and go through it with all the proper contexts and understand the linguistics and everything behind it. It's just not going to happen. But I do do a lot of research. One of the things that I did before I addressed William Tyndale and Mere Christian Logos and reformulated my question to Calvinists is I tried to get my mind around this whole idea of vessels of destruction, of vessels of wrath fitted for destruction, vessels of mercy, as it relates to where the agency is coming from. And uh, from my understanding of the linguistics behind it, this is sort of all interwoven with the concept of the potter and the clay. So to me, the agency there, what that's telling me is the agency for creating vessels of any kind is with God. And so, I want to close by saying this. I made a video to you, Len, which I haven't uploaded yet, and I'm not sure I'm going to. Answering a question you'd asked me in the comments section of what I thought of your video to William Tyndale. I'll nutshell it here in case I don't get a chance to upload that video. Uh, that's your fight. That's not my fight. You know where I stand on the topic. Uh, for me, it just poses a, a further problem for, you know, now you've got two salesmen trying to sell me the same car, but you disagree on some very, very basic fundamental characteristics of the car. But you're both telling me the car is excellent. But neither one of you can agree on whether or not it's had an accident or how much mileage it's got on, what kind of engine, how much fuel economy it gets, are there outstanding recalls, all that kind of stuff. So that's where I stand on that. That's your fight. It's not mine. From my understanding, limited understanding, I do believe that the, your Reformed theology is probably more accurate to Scripture. It's more consistent with Scripture. That's where I land on that. And I think you knew that already. I think that's probably why you asked me the question. More importantly, what I got out of that video was the language you were using in speaking to William Tyndale. 
And this probably isn't what you were looking for when you asked me for feedback on the video, but it's what you're going to get. Um, and that is, you said some, you, you were, you were uh, highly confrontational, I felt, and, and you used a lot of uh, incendiary language. You were dismissive of points, too. Um, you know, William Tyndale made a point, and you said, that is uh, <clears throat> an idiot straw man, Marty. Well, that's highly inflammatory language, and it's dismissive. You didn't really tear down the straw man, which would have been a good idea to do. And actually, I kind of felt, when I listened to that over again, I kind of felt like he may have had a valid point. But either way, that's inflammatory and dismissive to do that. And then later on, you you said something about hearing a response from him and that you you were proposing that he might uh, plagiarize. And I don't know if this is based on something in the past, but really, to me, it's immaterial. And I also understand that he has been a little bit harsh with you, you know, uh, P-Brain and some of the other comments he's made. But to me, that's immaterial as well, because only you can control how you relate to people. And you and I have had our toss-ups in the past, and I disengaged with you for that reason. And recently, I've given you props where props are due for your sort of new approach. And I would encourage you to continue that. One thing that always bothers me about this discourse is the people who claim the moral high ground don't always take the high road. And I think it's incumbent upon you to do that. If you're going to claim the only moral authority, you really should try to walk the walk as much as you can. And you haven't always done that in the past. You and I both know that. I would suggest, if you're going to engage with Marty, that you take the high road regardless of what he does. I mean, I think that's what you're supposed to do, right? And, and... You know, I mean, maybe maybe what you need to do is have a hangout with the two of you and both agree to calm the rhetoric down and just talk and just and just do your Bible study or whatever it is. But I don't think this highly inflammatory language and this dismissiveness is going to get you where you want to go. Ultimately, you may end up in a stalemate anyway. You may end up agreeing to disagree or whatever, however that works. But what have you really gained by by this? You know, at one point in your video, I thought it was interesting because you said, if you're going to continue to straw man me, Marty, I'm going to disengage with you. I'm not going to have dialogue with you. I found that interesting in light of what happened between you and I, because I expressed much the same to you. I said, you know, I, my concern is that if, we, if I ever entered a hangout with you or any kind of a show, that it may devolve into exactly that kind of abusive interaction, and I was not going to put up with it. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't subject myself to that. And at that time, you just suggested that I wasn't being genuine or that I needed to man up. And now when it's you doing it, it's valid, right? So I'm not trying to be too critical here. I'm just trying to point out that uh, that was the same standard that I was holding then. And I think it's reasonable for you to hold that standard now as well. Give Marty the opportunity to come at you respectfully or not at all. There's nothing wrong with that. But I would urge you, Len, to, to, it seems to me you're taking an approach now, and I really encourage it. I think it's better for everyone. It's better for the dialogue. That's my response to that video, uh, much as you may not like it. I hope you hear where it's coming from and not who it's coming from, because far be it from me to be the guy who's telling you how to conduct yourself. Um, I mean, I, I would hope that I've never gotten that far down in the gutter myself, so maybe I've got a, a place to start from. But just hear the message and disregard the messenger if, if that helps, because I think you're on the right track. That's enough of all of this blah, blah, blah from me. Um, thanks, everyone, for waiting through this, those who have made it this far. Thanks to Mere Christian Logos, William Tyndale, and Matthew 419 for uh, persevering through my ill-formed questions and giving me the answers, and I hope you can understand that I don't mean any of the things when I talk about your theology to be some sort of a personal attack. I'm just trying to understand the concepts that are being put forth, and ultimately, uh, yes, I am the judge over what I accept by my belief set. <clears throat> and if I'm not by your belief set, then you're trying to sell the vehicle to the wrong guy. You should be praying to God to soften my heart. That's enough for now. Thanks for watching.